I want to talk about this great prayer of um, the uh, Jewish religion, the Shema, it's called, and also the commandment that uh, goes with it. But really to understand this commandment, um, one has to grasp the true Christian understanding of God. There are a lot of different ideas about who God is and what God is. But, um, and not, unfortunately, not all Christians even completely understand it. And so uh, I want to start there. And there's so much to be said about it. I, I remember I, I, I had a class in Doctrine of God in the seminary, actually Bishop Barron, then Father Barron, uh, taught it. Um, and, and then I had another class on it. So there's just so much you can say about it. I, I want to really just <laughs> laser in on one thing. And that's that God is not a being, right? Not just not a being in the world. He's not a being at all. And this is something that it's clear in the atheists, in the modern atheists, and the so-called new atheists that they don't understand, you know. For instance, you might remember, if, you, if you're not old enough, you probably have read about it, perhaps. In the 50s, Yuri Gagarin, you know, the Russian cosmonaut, first person in the space. You know, he, he radios back, uh, uh, I've, been, I've seen the heavens, you know, and there's no God here. And, it's just, you, you can't find God in the world, right? You, you can't find God, scientists, you know, say, we, we want proof, you know. Some call it the Yeti theory of God, you know, Yeti, uh, Bigfoot. You know. Some say he exists, some say he doesn't. You know, let's find out, let's, let's research it. Let's, you can't find God that way. Scientists, although they get quite upset when church people talk about science things, it doesn't seem to bother scientists to talk about um, God and church things, right? But you cannot, I love science, you know that, but you cannot research God through science. And so what is God then? Well, we turn to philosophers and theologians. And for us particularly, we turn to Aquinas. And I should say first, even church people uh, can get this idea of wrong, uh, idea of God wrong. I remember clearly growing up, I heard all the time the phrase supreme being to, as a euphemism for God, you know. Well, Aquinas says God is not ens summum, supreme being, you know. God is ipsum esse subsistens. Esse, the Latin word to be, ipsum is itself, it's a reflexive uh, per, uh, pronoun, and subsistens. God is not a being, God is the subsistent act of to be. Now, I know that can give you a headache if you uh, think on that a little bit. But in other words, God is, subsist God is non-contingent. God is itself not a being, but is the very act of to be itself, is being, not a being, you know. In other words, God is the thing from which all beings come. He's the creator of the universe. God is not contingent. He's his own source of being, you might say. Uh, but to be clear, let's get out of that word, his own source of existence. And I've talked about contingency before, but it, it's important to understand, right? Every being comes from something, right? I'm a being, I come from somewhere, this ambo is a being. Okay, where does this ambo come from? From wood. Well, where is, did the wood come from? From a tree. Where did the tree come from? From a seed. Where did the seed come from? You keep going on and on, right? But you can't have an infinite regression of causes. 
somewhere you stop and say, this caused everything, but itself was not caused. Right? And that's what we mean, be, mean by God. Right? The thing, the ground of existence. The thing from which all beings come. So, what do we do with that? Here's another way of describing God from Anselm, St. Anselm. God is that than which no greater can be thought. You can scratch your heads on that one just a little bit too, you know. And so, I remember uh, Father Barron uh, talking about it this way. Because that sounds like, okay, so he's the greatest being. No, no, no. And he used the example Zeus, I remember. Zeus plus the world, Zeus being the god, uh, you guys know who Zeus is. Zeus plus the world is greater than just Zeus by himself. But God plus the world is not any greater. Adding the world to God, so to speak, doesn't make God any greater. And so, uh, I, I was thinking about this. You know how people go, God is great all the time, you know. And I forgot the last mass, Brian was sitting there, and he loves that thing. And I said, I really hate it, actually. And, uh, and I forgot he was sitting there. I looked over, I said, oh, yeah. But it, it's the nerd in me, really, that hates it. It's the theology nerd that hates it, you know. Because even to say God is great is inaccurate. Because it limits God to say God is great. Even to say God is the greatest limits God, you know what I mean? Because you can only put adjectives or those things on beings, right? And to say all the time is inaccurate. God lives outside of time and existed before time, you know. But I admit it, it doesn't have the same zing, you know, if Brian were to say, God is that thing which no greater can be thought, you know. And, and all the kids, of course, would answer then, eternally. It's just not the same, right? And so we speak in analogies, you know. Psalm 145 maybe comes the closest. It says, God's greatness cannot be measured. Yeah. But we say, you know, even Jesus speaks in analogies for us. The kingdom of God is like something, you know what I mean? Because we can't grasp it. And in fact, Augustine says, si comprehendis non est Deus. If you do understand it, it's not God. <laughs> so that's what we're up against, right? So at any rate, what does this all mean? Why is this important? It's important, it's not just important, it's vital, actually. And this is why. If God is his own source and means of existence, in other words, if God is not a being, then God doesn't need anything. In particular, he does not need anything from us, right? If God created me, God doesn't need me, I need God. And uh, so this is from Psalm 50, I like this. I do not ask more bullocks from your farms, nor goats from among your herds. For I own, you got to remember, offering sacrifice was a big thing for the Jews. Bullocks and, and bulls and goats, etc. For I own all the beasts of the forest. Were I hungry, I would not tell you. For I own the world and all it holds. Do you think I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? God doesn't need these things, right? God is not in competition with us. What's the great image of that? In the Old Testament, it's the burning bush, right? The bush is on fire, but not consumed. In the New Testament, of course, it's the incarnation, the 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 uh, distinctive uh, doctrine of the Christian church, that God takes on a human nature, is even able to do that, right? That a human and divine nature can coexist in one person 
And divine, the divine is not sullied and the uh, human is not consumed. And since I'm on a roll with fancy theological language, this is how the Council of Chalcedon put it. That in the one person of Jesus Christ, his divine and human natures coexist, quote, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. The distinction of natures not having been taken away by the union. And we struggled with that, and I, I wish I could go into the historical problems with it, but what it means is, as I said, the human and the divine nature can come together in Jesus, the one person Jesus, and coexist and not get blended like he's sort of human, sort of divine. He's half human, half, like a demigod. No, he's really God and really human. Now, so that means we're not in competition with God. God is not in competition with us. We don't have anything to fear from God. And of course, the modern atheists, that, that's, that's, um, that's their problem. Remember, like Feuerbach, Ludwig Feuerbach says, you know, nein zu Gott ist ja zu Menschen. You know, the no to God is the yes to humans. Or Jean-Paul Sartre, his famous syllogism, you know, if God exists, then I can't be free, but I am free. And so God does not exist. These ideas are contrary completely to um, Christi the Christian understanding of God, you know. And so now, listen to the Shema. You know. Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. Adonai Eloheinu, the Lord is God. Adonai Echad, and the Lord alone is God. Right? You can only have one source of everything. You can only have one of that than which greater cannot be thought. And so, what follows for that? Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And we do that not just because it's just, God is worthy of it, because we don't have to be afraid to do that. We, we, we're afraid of God at, at times. You wouldn't think that. And maybe it's unconscious. You know, we don't, no one would say, I'm afraid of God. But we act like it, right? Oh, I, I can't tithe because then I won't have enough for me. I don't want to be a priest, I've heard guys say, because then I won't be able to do what I want to do. Things like that. That's, that's a fear talking, you know? And so, because this is the thing, if God does not need anything from us, then why give this this command? See, what's important about this is not just what God commands, but why God commands it. If God doesn't need worship, bullocks and goats, then why did God command Israel to make sacrifices? If God doesn't need anything from me, why does God command me to love him with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength? Right? Here it is. If God is a being, then this is not a command, it's a demand. Right? He is, if he's the supreme being, he's leveling taxes, so to speak. You know, he's saying... I want this from you, and that from you, and that from you. But if God is not a being, if God is God, then why does he command this? It's a command. Well, for the same reason that you make rules for your children, you know. You want them to eat a certain way. You want them to eat well. Why? For your good? No, for your children's good. It doesn't change your health at all if your children just eat Pop-Tarts three times a day, maybe with some peanut butter on it, you know? It doesn't help me at all 
if you go to confession, if you use the sacrament. But I tell you all the time, use the sacrament of confession, right? As a matter of fact, it makes more work for me. I mean, I'd be better off if you didn't go, right? I have more time to whatever I do. But no, I do it for your good. And so God commands us to love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. Not for his good, for our good. We don't have to be afraid of this commandment, afraid of giving God everything. It's, it's the Christian paradox. It's right at the heart of the religion. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever would lose her life for my sake will find it. And who are, who are the great examples of this? The saints. They gave their lives to God and they were not diminished. They did not lose they gained. How do we depict them in art? With halos glowing, right? And who's the greatest example of these examples? The one who made herself nothing. I'm the handmaid of the Lord. Do with me as you please. And what does she become? She is the true ends summum. She is the true highest being. She's the highest being in creation. Because she made herself the lowest. You know? And so listen to what I might call the Christian Shema. Hear, O oh Christians, the Lord is God. The Lord alone is God. And does not need anything from you. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You will become then the highest and best that you can be.